Hey, everybody, this is Tony Mormino, and welcome to the Engineers HVAC podcast, where we share our HVAC application and design experience. So in this episode, I'm kind of on this natatorium kick lately. We recently did a pool room unit job at the Omni Hotel, which is a historic inn here in Asheville, North Carolina, which is where I'm located. So going to put out a bunch of content regarding natatorium unit, natatorium room design. And if you're not familiar with that word, basically that's pool room units. So I've been in the air conditioning business since 1997. And for most of that time, I've actually been the pool pack rep and pool pack's been around for, I don't know, probably 45 years, um, made in the USA pool dehumidification unit. So um, but as a rep, you know, I had to learn many times over and over how to assist engineers when they were designing natatoriums or pool rooms because I, I kind of came up in the industry in, in Jacksonville, Florida, and we didn't have a lot of indoor pool rooms. And I know every time an engineer called me and asked for help, which I was I was thankful for, I would have to go grab my pool pack and natatorium design guide and relearn some of the basics. And fortunately enough, it quickly came back to me as to what I need to do. And, and what, one of the things I've learned about pool rooms is they're very misunderstood. And if you get them wrong, it could be really, really painful. I've seen a lot of designs that were not, um, you know, maybe by somebody who didn't take the time or wasn't sure and made a mistake. And, and trust me, I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes too. Um, and it, but they're very painful and very costly to correct. So I'm doing this podcast. I'm also have this video on YouTube. If you want to watch it there, Insight Partners HVAC TV is our YouTube channel, but I'm basically going to read some of the highlight areas from the natatorium design guide that is, is published by pool pack. It's on their website. There'll be a link in the podcast and video description where you can go download it. I highly, highly recommend you do. It's very well written. It's very well done. And I'm just basically going to read some of the pages. It's 47 pages long. I'm not going to read them all here, of course, but I am going to read some of the highlights, which I think might be important. So if you're new to the industry or you've been around a while and you want to listen to the podcast and just kind of, you know, freshen up on editorium design, thought maybe this would be helpful to, for some folks. So um, so I'll go ahead and get started. So the the design is called Natatorium Design Guide. Uh, the, the subtitle here is Everything Engineers, Contractors, and Owners need to know to create the optimal indoor pool environment. And, if, and like I said before, it's written by Pool Pack, a very large and experienced um, pool room dehumidification company in the United States. So um, a little bit about the author here. Go to the next page. Um, okay, so the about the author page here. So this was written by Ralph Kittler, who's a PE. Um, and here's what it says. The creation of this natatorium design guide has been a collaboration between the sales service and engineering teams of three of industry's most respected dehumidifier brands led by Ralph Kittler. Quite simply, nobody in the industry has better credentials than Ralph to create all of our natatorium design educational materials. In addition to being a founding partner of one of dehumidified air solutions manufacturers, he is also currently chairman of the CDC's Council for Model Aquatic Health Code Ad Hoc Committee on Indoor, Indoor Air Quality. Ralph was an ASHRAE Distinguished lecturer, lecturer on pool design for 12 years and sits on two technical committees, TC-810, Mechanical Dehumidifiers and Related Equipment, and TC-9.8, um, Large Building Air Conditioning Application. So he is a primary reviser on two ASHRAE handbook chapters and helped create the new, quote unquote, indoor pool design chapter Applications 2019, Chapter 25. So what I took from that is he, Ralph knows pool rooms, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, very well trusted source there, that's for certain. Um, okay, so the introduction here. And I'm again, I'm not going to read all this, but I, I have some highlighted areas here. I, I will, I'll read and then, you know, maybe that could help give you a little, uh, little direction here. So introduction, the know-how and experience to provide a first-class indoor Pool experience exists today. There are hundreds of successful indoor pools currently operating in North America. 
Resources are available to help guide and educate indoor pool designers, operators, and owners. In 2019, Ashray created a new chapter in the design handbooks dedicated to indoor pool design. The CDC's Council for Model Aquatic Health Code, it's also known as CMAHC, is also widely working to provide better guidelines on pool design and indoor air quality. And there's a quote here, the building HVAC system and all equipment must perform reliably day in and day out. A first class indoor pool experience should be everyone's expectation. Fortunately, it is absolutely possible to provide a safe, healthy and comfortable indoor pool environment, all while keeping operating systems operating costs at a minimum. There is no one thing that will ensure a successful pool. Many things need to come together during the design and then during operations. This puzzle, and if you're if you're just listening to this, there's a puzzle here. Uh, it's like a circle and it shows a successful pool and it's got these puzzle pieces and the puzzles pieces are named HVAC, water chemistry, design, uh, building design, operation and maintenance and IAQ. So all those together um, are required for a successful indoor pool application. This puzzle helps illustrate the key factors needed for success. It is a coordinated effort. Proper design sets the stage and continues success for operation and maintenance. The building itself also needs to be designed suitable for higher temperature and dew point application. An indoor pool environment is different from traditional conditioned spaces and needs to be designed appropriately. The building HVAC system and equipment must perform reliably day in and day out, ideally with minimum energy consumption, no matter the ambient temperatures or levels of pool activity. And the, the level of pool activity certainly can affect, can affect what's going on in the pool room. So let's a little bit more on the introduction here and then we'll start with the basics. This guide is a culmination of decades of experience from a multitude of contributors and partners. We have seen firsthand what works and what doesn't. And then I'll just read this final quote here. It says, an auditorium is one of the most notoriously difficult facilities to design because there are so many critical considerations. And I, I'll break away from the manual and just say my experience is that is true. <laughs> there are a lot that there's a lot that goes into pool room design. So if you're a consultant, um, please make sure what I always did, like I said before, because I didn't touch these every day, I always made sure I got my local rep or a trusted source um, that would help me go into detail in the pool room and make sure I got it right from the from the get go because it is it is so much different than a normal you know commercial everyday application which we're used to. Um, okay, so back to the manual. So this is I believe this is chapter one called the basics. The auditorium experience for a patron should be no different than any other room in a building. It should be comfortable, healthy, and have good air quality. When designing an auditorium, the first recommended step for designers is to meet with the facility's owners to discuss the desired operating conditions and expectations. Only once the operating conditions and expectations are defined, can the designer effectively calculate loads and address the design aspects. An auditorium is one of the most notoriously difficult facilities to design because there are so many critical factors, uh, critical considerations, excuse me, that if overlooked can develop into serious problems affecting the building structure or result as an unpleasant experience or ill health effects for the occupants. There are vital design aspects that must be considered in order to deliver a successful facility. These include relative humidity levels, condensation, air temperature, pool water temperature, pool activities, air distribution, outdoor air, exhaust air, pool water treatment, and chloramine control. There are new technologies available that will reduce the possibility, uh, reduce and possibly eliminate chloramines. To ensure good air quality within a facility, an investment in one of these technologies is a must. UV water treatment, and the evacu evacuator source, that's capital E, evacuator source capture system are two highly effective technologies for chloramine control. The treated and conditioned air 
must be delivered down into the breathing zone where the patrons are located if there is to be a reasonable expectation of providing good air quality and a comfortable experience. Okay, next chapter is entitled Health, Safety, and Comfort. And it goes something like this. Poor indoor air quality, poor indoor air quality makes swimmers and lifeguards sick. Plain and simple. Sadly, this is well documented in the bane of competitive swimming and indoor pool industry in general. Temperature and relative humidity play a critical role in the human comfort levels. It is essential that both are controllable and stable. While temperature control is generally well understood and mastered by designers, it is important to recognize that special temperature levels that natatorium it is important to recognize the special temperature levels that natatorium patrons expect. The space temperatures in a natatorium are unique to each project and assumptions must never be made. Proper control of relative humidity levels is also a concern because of the direct effect on human comfort and health. Figure one, which is shown here, demonstrates relative humidity levels outside of the optimum zone. 40 to 60% range can result in human vulnerability to disease. These diseases include bacteria, viruses, fungi, or fungi, fungi, I think that's how it's said, mites, and other contaminants that lower air quality and will potentially lead to respiratory issues. And by the way, there's going to be no editing to this. So you're going to get all the ums and ahs and myth, miss, see, I just did one, mispronunciations as we go along. And I'm, I hope that will be acceptable to everybody listen. Okay. While 40% is certainly an acceptable indoor relative humidity level, most indoor pools do not operate lower than 50% RH due to significantly increased operating costs. There's a couple bullet points here. Uh, let's see, bullet point number one, at lower RH levels, the pool evaporation rate increases dramatically. This increases both the dehumidification load and the pool water heating requirement. Bullet point two, in cold climate applications, it is important to ensure that, to ensure no more outdoor air be introduced than what the code requires. More is often not better in this case, as it causes the RH levels to plummet as low as 20%, dramatically increasing air and pool water heating costs. Bullet point number three, swimmers leaving the water will also feel chilly at lower relative humidity levels due to the evaporation off their bodies. And there's a chart here, figure one, relative humidity impacts and occupation health. And again, if you're listening to this on the podcast, there's a link below to the YouTube channel where you can see an actual video of this, or you can just go download the PDF that I'm reading from. The type of facility being designed will typically dictate the space temperature. Table ones helps target some typical conditions. It is critical to understand who will be using the facility in order to deliver conditions most likely to satisfy them. And I'll just pull a few conditions off here. So there, there's different types of pool rooms, right? There's competitive, diving, elderly swimmers, hotels, physical therapy, recreation, whirlpool spa, kids swim schools. And each of those have different water and air temperatures. So that's extremely important to know what the use of the natatorium is gonna be. Probably the, one of the first questions to ask the, the owner of the facility. And, and then you wanna make sure, I would not assume, for example, in competitive um, swimming here, the air temperature says 75 to 85 and the water temp says 76 to 82. So I wouldn't assume anything. I would just take these ranges as a, as a guide and then make sure you have that discussion. Um, um, with the owner. So some general notes here, with which look kind of important. General note one, uh, discuss the plan operation of the facility with the operator to establish operating temperatures and general expectations. Note two, facilities with warmer water temperatures tend to have warmer space temperatures. Warmer space, warmer spaces have higher dew points and will have condensation issues unless the building is designed suitable for this application. Bullet point three, physical therapy facilities will often cater to the comfort of the therapist rather than to the patient. The patient is generally not in the space for more than an hour, whereas the therapist is there all day. The designer should consult local codes. Some states, some states require a full purge of the clinic room air 
with 100% outdoor for every hour of occupancy. There's a couple more bullet points here that I'm gonna skip over to get to the next point here, which is humidity control calculations. Okay, humidity control calculations. While warm space temperatures in 50 to 60% relative humidity levels are ideal for patron comfort, they also translate to high dew point conditions, which can lead to condensation problems and serious damage to the building structure in cold slash cold weather. If the building structure itself has not been properly designed for this higher indoor dew point application, catastrophic results may occur. The architect should design and protect the building envelope based on an indoor dew point design condition. Controlling humidity to provide this stable dew point condition year round requires that a total moisture load be accurately calculated. This moisture load must be removed from the space at the same rate it is generated in order to maintain stable conditions. It is imperative that the designer know what the operating temperatures will be in order to properly establish loads. Sensible load calculation. Every building's moisture load is calculated the same way. There are generally three sources of moisture that are considered. Internal load, pool evaporation, occupants, and outdoor air load. In the summer, the outdoor air tends to be a load, but since it is warm outside, condensation is not a concern, so it is recommended to model the space at 60% RH. In the winter, there is significant risk of condensation, so it is recommended to model at 50% RH. The outdoor air in winter almost always is a dehumidification credit, making this easily achievable. Okay, moving on to pool evaporation, and we're still in the humidity control calculations section. Pool evaporation. The internal load of an auditorium is the evaporation from the pool water and continuously wet surfaces. In an auditorium, this represents the majority of the total dehumidification load. Consequently, it is essential to accurately predict the pool evaporation. There are five variables used to calculate the pool evaporation rate. One, pool water surface area. Two, pool water temperature. Three, room air temperature. Four, relative, I'm sorry, room air relative humidity and five, pool water agitation and activity factor. The first four variables are straightforward and should be dictated by the owner. They are used to calculate the baseline occupied evaporation rate in the natatorium. Okay, moving along here. The activity factor is the fifth variable. It is used to evaluate, evaluate how much water agitation and splashing is expected when the pool is in use and how it increases the evaporation from the baseline value. Chapter six of ASHRAE's HVAC Applications Handbook publishes an activity factor table, table two, based on years of empirical field and test data. So there's a, there's a table here called activity factors, and this is extremely important. You know, if you have an el elderly swim facility, for example, it's 0.65. Um, if you have a public YMCA, it's one, a uh, wave pool is 1.5 to 2, so you can see as the number increases, it it just means the water is going to be more agitated. Um, okay, and then the next area here talks about water features and toys. It is important to understand that the entire effective water surface area and relative velocity, and then it says in parentheses um, or in brackets, air and or water, is required to estimate evaporation. Manufacturers of water features and toys do not publish evaporation loads for their products, forcing engineers to estimate. As a result, any indoor space heavily laden with water toys will make it difficult to accurately model dehumidification loads, so it is important for designers to set expectations with owners. For example, there should not be an expectation that relative humidity levels will be maintained. So that's an interesting um, note there for sure. Okay. Occupant load swimmers. Oh, let me move the next screen here. Okay. Occupant load swimmers are not usually considered occupants as they are submerged in the water. Swimmers and their water agitation are included in the activity factor spectators 
especially in facilities that host large swim meets, can total several thousand and add a significant moisture load. So um, there's a activity level for the spectators as well. Um, it ranges from quietly seated to highly enthusiastic, which is about you know four times more than quietly seated. So anyway, pay attention to that. Um, the next area here is called swim meets. Facilities that host swim meets have two distinct modes of operation, normal daily use and swim meets. To evaluate the peak dehumidification load during swim meets, which occurs during the warmups, there's a note here for that, an activity factor of 1.0 should be used. The total number of spectators and competitors on the pool deck must also be included in the load. Cold codes, excuse me, also generally require that each spectator be provided with 7.5 CFM of outside air. The load impact of the outdoor air must also be calculated. Facilities should size equipment based on the larger of the two main operating modes. Okay, next, spectator galleries. If there is a dedicated spectator gallery of a suitable size, there should be an opportunity to create a separate microclimate for them during the swim meets using a dedicated spectator HVAC unit. A dedicated HVAC unit can deliver an extra out, deliver the extra outdoor air needed to this area during the meet while also providing highly different, usually cooler, space conditions that is more comfortable for the spectators. Okay, next area, outdoor air. The introduction of outside or the introduction of outdoor air is essentially is essential to maintaining good air quality in any facility. The impact of this outdoor air ventilation on an auditorium changes with the weather in the geographical location of the facility. Introducing outdoor air during the summer generally adds moisture to the space and in the winter removes moisture from the space for maximum dehumidification low calcs the summer design conditions are considered construction codes generally require that outside air be introduced into a commercial building during occupied hours ashray standard 62 table 6.1 recommends the introduction of outdoor air into an auditorium at the following rates and that could be looked up i'm not going to read that off to you i think we're all pretty familiar with this Okay, the purpose of the outside air, next page here. The purpose of the outside air in part is to help define, uh, it is to help dilute chemicals off gas from the water. Exceeding code requirements for outside air will not necessarily provide better air quality. In winter, it will significantly increase the operating expense and in summer may increase the dehumidification load. And to follow here, again, if you're listening, is a, it shows the load estimation software which you can get access to through your local representative, which will be able to help you size the unit. And most manufacturers have a load calc um, to help design, uh, to help you size the natatorium unit, okay? So it asks for the main pool area. If there's a spa, it talks about the wetted deck area, the pool room volume, um, number of spectators, things like that. The, the conditions, desired conditions of the room temperature to the desired conditions of the water and several other factors location and it will actually size the unit for you so get with your local trusted pool representative okay moving along here to the next chapter called indoor air quality good indoor air quality must be the primary goal for all it is if it is of top concern it will get the attention it needs and deserves the definition of acceptable indoor air quality for an indoor pool is something the Council for the Model Aquatic Health Codes, CMAHC, research is trying to define for North America. Currently, there is no definition regarding what chemical levels are acceptable before having a negative impact on human physiology. The World Health Organization has established a guideline of 0.5 micrograms for, per cubic meter for gas phase trichloramine concentrations in pools. A slightly more stringent value of 0.3 mg per m cubed was suggested by a research group from Belgium. It is possible, it, a possible outcome for the project is identified of a different guide guideline for gas phase N 
CL3 concentration, but for now, most recognized uh, the need to stay under 0.5 M micrograms per meter cubed. Part of CMAHC's research is to find a means to measure trichloramines levels with commercially available sensors in the HVAC system. Currently, there are no viable trichloramine sensors that can be used in HVAC. So research, it, so the research is hoping to find a suitable replacement, perhaps similar to VOC or CO2 levels. Once that is established, HVAC system control strategies will be able to adjust based on the chemical levels in the space. While this can have an impact on the IEQ, it will always be reactive to the chemicals already being off gas. Addressing water chemical levels directly will have a more immediate impact on IEQ because fewer chemicals will off gas. Maintaining optimal chemical levels should always be the focus when trying to achieve the best indoor air quality. Designers that follow the ASHRAE handbook guidelines, as well as those recommended in this guide, should have every expectation of a great space condition and a pleasant indoor pool uh, experience. There are steps a design engineer must take to minimize the chance that a patron experiences discomfort or ill health effects. There are many factors that impact the IAQ in an auditorium. These include pool water chemistry problems, inadequate outdoor air, air stagnation, pool air distribution, high humidity, facility maintenance and operation, as well as occupant slash swimmer behavior. And then there's something in brackets here. Urine in pools is responsible for 50% of chemical issues. Four key factors having the most direct impact on indoor air quality are under the control of the design engineer. One, poor air distribution, no airflow in the breathing zone. Two, air change rate three, outdoor air ventilation, four, exhaust air, chemical source capture. Factors that have a significant impact on IAQ but are not under the control of the HVAC design engineer are pool water chemistry, maintenance, operation, and patron behavior. It is vital that these are addressed by the pool facility operator. And I'm going to go off script here and say that you know, in my experience, if the pool water chemistry is not correct, there's very little you can do from an HVAC standpoint to make the facility um, more acceptable. So that's just my, that's not part of the manual. That's just my Tony Mormino experience, uh, two cents there for whatever that's worth. So, okay. The next section is called breathing zone. The single most important focus of the HVAC design is to provide adequate supply air down into the breathing zone. The supplier from the HVAC system has been conditioned in filters with outdoor air blended in. It is the best quality air the system has to offer. When supply air is delivered down into the breathing zone, patrons will enjoy the best possible air quality. A properly designed facility will adequately control and remove chloramines while providing the treated and conditioned air to where it is most needed into the breathing zone deck area. Next section, air change rate. ASHRAE recommends proper volumetric supplier changes per hour are important to ensuring that the entire room will see air movement. Stagnant areas must be avoided as they will be prone to condensation and air quality problems. Short cycling between supply and return air must be avoided as it significantly reduces the actual air changes within the space and the overall effectiveness, uh, effectiveness of the HVAC system. ASHRAE recommends one, uh, note bullet point one, four to six volumetric air changes per hour in a regular natatorium. Bullet point number two, six to eight volumetric air changes per hour in spectator areas. A quick calculation will determine the supply air requirement. And then there's a calculation here. Um, which you can look up. It's, well, I can just read it here. Supplier CFM equals room volume in cubic feet times the desired air changes divided by 60. The room volume determines the amount of supply air required, the amount of supply air a space requires. Okay, outside air ventilation. The amount of outdoor air 
to be introduced to the facility is determined by local codes. Most codes adopt ASHRAE standard 62. Outdoor air is critical towards diluting airborne chemicals and maintaining good air quality. Facilities that introduce outdoor air per ASHRAE standard 62 and have the proper slash effective air distribution will have outstanding IA will have outstanding IAQ. There's a couple bullet points here. Bullet point one, more outdoor air than required by ASHRAE 62 is not required for good IAQ if the air distribution is done well, except for indoor water and splash parks. Two, outdoor air requires a significant amount of heating energy in winter and must be included in the heat load calculations. Three, heat recovery should be considered between the exhaust air and outdoor air streams. Four, introduce the outside air at the factory provided intakes on the air handlers. Okay. And I'll break in here with a with a quick note. The outside air on natatorium units is after the coils. So it's in it's almost in like it's before the fan typically, before the supply fan, but it's not before the the cooling coils, at least on all the units I've done. Okay, back into the in the manual here. And I think we're on note number five. Locate outdoor air intakes away from sources of airborne contaminants, such as exhaust fans and plumbing vents. Um, note number six, the outdoor, outdoor air may need to be preheated to 65 degrees if more than 35% of total airflow is outdoor air or in the winter design temperature below 10 degrees. And final note here, a certified air balancing contractor must balance the system airflow. All air handlers for indoor pools must be equipped with an outdoor air connection, filter, two position motorized damper, and balancing damper. Okay, I'm gonna skip over the exhaust air here and talk a little bit about pool water chemistry. Pool water chemistry. If there are no chemicals off-gassing, there is no air quality issue. All effort towards minimizing chemical off-gassing in the design and operation of the pool will directly impact IAQ. Pool water chemistry and facility operation are key variables impacting IQ that are not generally under the control of the design engineer. I was going to add my own two cents or the supplier of the equipment or the manufacturer of the equipment. So there's a lot, there's not much we could do if the pool chemistry is, is really bad. Um, in my experience. Okay. Back to the, back to the guide here. Good pool water chemistry is critical in order to achieve high levels of human health and comfort. Maintaining ideal pool water conditions also ensures the best possible indoor air quality and optimal performance for the system. There are new technologies available to help with water chemistry and chloramine management, such as the evacuator, evacuator, capital E system, and ultraviolet UV light treatment systems. Okay, the next paragraph, couple paragraphs is titled um, chloramine or chlorine smell, which is a big, a big deal in you go back up here, chlorine smell. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So this is a very common uh, misconception I've seen before. And okay, back to the manual. It is a common misconception that a strong chlorine odor is caused by too much chlorine in the water. The odor is actually caused by chloramines and then brackets combined chlor chlorines off gassing from the pool water surface. Chloramines are found in the pool water when there is sufficient free chlorine in the pool to address the nitrogen containing components brought into the pool water by the swimmers swimmers these nitrogen components naturally occur and contain naturally occurring and contain in sweat urine body oils and other proteins that get released into the pool water if the introduction of these nitrogen compounds outpaces the introduction of free chlorine the chlorine combines with the nitrogen compounds rather than fully oxidizing them the chloramine levels increase in the water, resulting in the increased chloramine off-gassing, which creates the odor of chlorine in the room. There are three different types of chloramines that can form monochloramine, dichloramine, and trichloramine. Trichloramine is the most volatile and will off-gas most quickly. Off-gas chloramines have a strong attraction to the airborne 
humidity and will combine with moisture in the air. Consequently, any condensation of space humidity will become corrosive. Okay, I'm gonna skip over to humidity and corrosion. Humidity and corrosion, any condensation of the humidity will become corrosive. It is critical that the space humidity levels be controlled to prevent condensation as well as damaging the building and mechanical system. By design, indoor pool environments are warmer and as a result have higher dew point temperatures compared to traditional spaces. Engineers and architects must understand the consequences of moisture of moist corrosive air and pay attention to its potential impact on the entire HVAC system and building envelope. It is the best practice to ensure that all electrical components are located in the separate mechanical vestibule protected from pool air from the pool air stream. All components in contact with a pool air stream should be protected with the best possible corrosion paints, coatings, and materials available. Okay, so the last section we're gonna discuss is condensation control. There's much, much more to this manual. And again, you can find that in the uh, description of either the podcast or our YouTube video, whichever way you're watching it, please go download that anytime. I'm gonna talk about condensation control here. So it says, while 50 to 60% relative humidity levels are ideal for patient comfort and health, they are much higher than in traditional, they are much higher than in traditional spaces in winter. In cold climates, it is very common to humidify in order to get the humidity levels up to 30 to 40%. An indoor pool and humidified space can experience condensation problems and serious damage to the building structure in cold weather as they are not properly uh, designed. If they are not properly, if they are not designed properly. Condensation triggers the destructive process as it leads to the growth of mold and mildew. If allowed to occur inside the building walls or roof, condensation will cause deterioration and can devastate the structure by freezing in, in the winter. It is critical that condensation be avoided at all cost. The building design and construction must be appropriate to house an indoor pool and must be suitable for 50 to 60% relative humidity year round. A successful design will identify and blanket building elements that have low R values, typically exterior windows with warm supply air to prevent condensation. Window frames and emergency exit doors must also be thermally broke to avoid condensation. Dew point temperature. Condensation forms on surfaces when surface temperatures are lower than the dew point of the surrounding air. The first step in condensation control is to establish the space dew point temperature based on the desired space conditions. With that information, the designer can establish potential condensation spots in the building. A pool's indoor design dew point will typically range from 62 to 69 degrees Fahrenheit. And then it also says, 82 to 84 Fahrenheit, 50 to 60 percent RH. Contrast this to typical spaces in winter that might be 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 40 percent RH, which can have a 45 percent dew point. Okay. Pools have a much higher likelihood of condensation because of both elevated space temperature and slightly higher, higher relative humidity, resulting in very high dew point. The building, these building elements with low R values that have an inside surface temperature below that dew point in winter design conditions. Most importantly, the dew point also establishes where to locate the vapor retarder in the wall. Figure four shows typical pool design of 82 degrees, 50% RH, has a dew point of 62 degrees. Therefore, any surface with a temperature below 62 degrees Fahrenheit will condensate moisture. And there's some charts here. Um, there's some really good cutaways of installation of walls that shows where the vapor barrier um, should be. And I'll read a little bit more of this. So it says vapor retarder. A vapor retarder is a material that restricts the rate of water vapor diffusion through the ceiling and walls of a building when below, when below dew point temperature occurs. Figure five illustrates how failure to install the vapor retarder in the proper condition 
re will result in condensation within the structure. The condensation in the walls or roof can lead to structural failure. A vapor retarder should be sealed at all seams. It is important to ensure the entire pool enclosure design, walls and ceilings, have a vapor retarder in the correct location. Care must be taken where the walls and roof and walls and floor meet to assure there is no breach in the vapor barrier. Proper location and installed, a properly located and installed vapor retarder is the only means of protecting a building structure from vapor migration that results in moisture damage. And then there's a figure six here, an example of a wall detail with its temperature gradient. This exercise allows the designer to identify the dew point temperature in the wall where the vapor retarder must be installed. Okay, a few more sections here. Window design. Windows have a relatively low R value and as a result will have surface temperatures below the pool room dew point when the outside temperatures are cold. Exterior walls will develop condensation on the first cold day unless preventative measures are taken. The solution to the condensation problem is to fully blanket every part of the window with supplier from the HVAC system. It is critical that no section be missed or the window will get cold and condense. And then there's a couple of diagrams here that show that. And next section here is air distribution. Since exterior windows and exterior doors are primary, our primary condensation concern, it is extremely important that the supply air is focused on these areas. The warm air from the dehumidifier will keep the window surface temperature above the dew point temperature and in turn ensure that the window, windows and exterior doors remain condensation free. There are five basic steps for the basic air distribution. One, supply air to the breathing zone at the deck level and water surface. Two, supply air to exterior windows and doors. Three, supply air to the remainder of the room to ensure there are no stagnant areas. Four, locate the return duct where it will optimize the entire flow pattern. And five, prevent air short cycling by avoiding supply air diffusers near the return grill. Okay, so we got about, I would say about halfway through the manual and we'll go ahead and end it there. The other chapters here, I'll read them off to you. There's, uh, we, look, we finished up with condensation control, then it goes on to energy considerations, finalizing the system design, popular configuration and system designs, replacement systems, vital features to specify, design and installation details, humidity control technology and design. There's a design checklist for traditional pools. So excellent manual. Again, please go and check it out. The link is in the podcast description or the video description, wherever you're, wherever you're watching this, Natatorium Design by Pool Pack. Everything kind engineers, contractors, and owners need to know to create the optimal pool environment. environment. And again, if you're watching this or listen, if you're listening to this on the podcast, please check out the video version or just come check out our YouTube channel, Insight Partners HVAC TV. And thank you so much for listening. And we hope that you enjoyed it. Thank you.